Um, thank you so much for attending today. And I cannot tell you how much I cannot wait until we can do this in person. Um, because I've been in these meetings before and there is zero awkward silence before the presentation <laughs> starts uh, in person. And I totally look forward to that one day. Um, a little, a little housekeeping on our format today. Um, it's just going to be some panelist Q&A um, with some of your top questions that you guys have submitted. Um, there will not be a PowerPoint, so if you don't see that, that's exactly what we expect. Um, and if you stick around to the end, you will get um, HRCI CE credits for this morning's presentation. Um, so with that, let me, inter let me uh, introduce our two panelists, if you guys want to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Oh, hi, Carrie. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Carrie Nicholson, and I am HR and Benefits Compliance Advisor, um, and I'm also in sales. So look forward to sharing the next 45 minutes with all of you. And good morning, everybody. I'm Susan Colhane. Um, I've been with Nolte for over 20 years doing HR and benefit consulting as well. And uh, look forward to answering your questions. You gave us some good questions this morning. So uh, look forward to that. And we probably our disclaimer is that we are not attorneys. <laughs> we are benefits uh, consultants and HR consultants. And so we interpret the best that we can. Uh, we do have an attorney on staff that we can bounce questions off to. Um, so if you do have particular questions, I actually uh, sent her three questions yesterday. So, um, but uh, just know that we're going to do the best in interpreting what we see right now. And uh, the whole point of this conversation is to create more discussion uh, to help clarify, but also to create more discussion uh, with all of you in the future. So. So on that note, um, there are two features in the in the program. There is a chat feature and a Q&A feature. Uh, the chat is certainly fun to, to make fun of the presenter or the guy asking the questions. Um, but if you want to ask questions legitimately, do that in the Q&A section. That will allow us to keep track of those behind the scenes because it's unlikely we will get to them in our 45 minutes. But we want to make sure we answer those um, timely for, for all of you. So let's see, to start with, we've got a quick poll. So how many of you are feeling overwhelmed with keeping up with employee benefits in 2021? And if anybody says no, you might as well sign off right now. <laughs> well, we actually. I'm just kidding. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't give away the. I won't give anything away yet. <laughs> all right. It looks like that's that's all we're gonna get there. So let's end that and let's see how we did. It looks good. like 62 percent of us are feeling pretty overwhelmed. Um, that includes your presenters today. And 38% um, are not feeling very overwhelmed. And I think that's wonderful. That means you guys are doing your homework and uh, hopefully your team at Nulti has taken good care of you. All right, let's move on to question number one. So what is going on with the ARP and the COBRA subsidy? Okay, I get to answer this question. So, um, there's a lot going on, but for those of you who have done COBRA administration um, for quite a long time, you probably remember we had this a few years back where there was a subsidy. So basically along the same lines, um, if you have a COBRA administrator, they pretty much are doing all the work for you. So that's that's the good thing. Um, if you do COBRA on your own, then yes, you definitely need to, uh, to handle this. And we can walk through. So basically, it, there is a 100% subsidy where COBRA premiums can be paid from April 1st of this year through September 30th of this year. And that's the, the subsidy. So that means that former employees who were uh, who left your workplace involuntarily, and I'm gonna get to that in just a minute and explain what that is, they have an opportunity to re-sign up for COBRA and get this subsidy. And that means they are not paying for the premium. 
actually the employer, you are taking care of that premium and getting a credit back on your taxes. So this applies to all federal COBRA and state mini COBRA laws. So it's involuntary terminations. So we have heard from a few of you um, that maybe your payroll system did not track involuntary terminations correctly. So that's something that you, you should look at is go back to November of 2019, look at everybody who left your workplace and make sure that if they fall under this category, the involuntary, um, that they are eligible. So what does involuntary mean? It is a reduction in hours of status or they ended a leave, reduction in force. If there was a USERA reduction in hours or termination, work stoppage. Um, and so they are those that are eligible for uh, a new COBRA election period. So the people who are ineligible are those that voluntarily terminated, so they quit, there was gross misconduct, bankruptcy, state continuation, retiree bankruptcy, um, and dependent qualifying events. So, for example, my son is off of our plan at the end of May because he turns 26. He is not going to get um, this subsidy. The other uh, ineligibility piece is if they have other group health coverage available. So maybe they got a new job or their spouse has a job where they can be covered under that plan or they are on Medicare. So that means they are also ineligible for this subsidy. The last thing is if they reach their maximum continuation coverage of COBRA. So most often, as all of you guys know, it's 18 months. There are some other situations, but if they've reached that maximum of continuation coverage for COBRA, then they're not eligible either. This does apply to all group plans. So your medical, dental, vision, it does not uh, count, FSA does not uh, count to be subsidized. And it applies to those that did not elect COBRA and those that did, but may have stopped for some reason. Um, for example, they couldn't afford it. So that's really the whole reason why we have this uh, COBRA subsidy through the American Rescue Plan. And there is a new notice of eligibility. So if you have not done that yet, or your COBRA administrator has not done that yet, you have until May 31st to get this out to all um, eligible, eligible uh COBRA participants. So again, most often your COBRA TPA has probably been in contact with you. Um, they will handle this notice. There is a new notice that does have specific language in it. So then once they get that notice, just like before, they have 60 days to elect. And again, this does not extend their max eligibility period. It just whatever they were eligible for, for example, 18 months, it stays that way. And coverage can start on April 1st at the earliest. It does not go retro. Um, that has been a big question because the carriers are not, so basically it's adverse selection. If, if it goes retro, then that means those people had claims, but this subsidy does not go retro. Um, and there's gonna be no refund of previous paid premiums either. So that was always a question that we get. So like I said earlier, the assistance eligible beneficiaries do not pay the COBRA premiums during this, this time from April 1st through September 30th. They do not have to make any payment to you or to the COBRA administrator. You, the employer, actually receive a tax credit. And I'm sure you probably have heard about that, but if you have not, talk to um, your accounting team about that and, and they should know how to take it. So employers can allow these individuals to change plans, but it's not mandated. So that's one thing that you want to, you know, maybe have a discussion about is um, if you're going to allow them to change plans. But again, you don't have to. You also need to provide the notice of an expiration of periods of premium assistance. So if this is going to end at September, which is what it's slated to end right now is at the end of September, you are to provide them a notice that this premium assistance is going away. Now, none of us have a magic um, ball that we can look into to see if this is going to be extended. It might, 
And then if that's the case, if it's extended past September, you would have to notice that, give them a notice that this has been extended. But if it doesn't get extended, then you have to send them an expiration. So people ask, well, what if I fail to comply with this? Well, if you fail to comply, um, there is $100 per qualified beneficiary with a maximum of $200 per family per day. So it's pretty significant if you don't comply. And if you have a COBRA administrator, they are eager to help you out with this. So I'm going to, um, when Carrie's gonna be putting, or talking about question number two, I'm gonna put a link in the uh, chat feature. The DOL has all of this information out on their website. There's a great FAQ. The model notices are out there. So I'm going to put that in the chat. So if you guys want to go out there and get more information, it is out there. So that's it for COBRA. So one quick reminder, um, be sure and put your questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat section. Um, real quickly, um, Susan, yes. um, if somebody's terminated for disciplinary action, how, how does this apply? You know, that, again, I'm not an attorney, but it's just like before, um, the gross misconduct. I think you have to be very careful. In these situations, I would always err on the employee's side, the former employee side. And um, there's very, there is a list of gross misconduct out, you know, and look at that. Um, but otherwise, I... If it was not gross misconduct, I would send them, and I do think that they would be an eligible beneficiary. But always ask your attorney, because <laughs> they're the ones that have to defend you, uh, if not. Perfect, thank you. Welcome. Well, Carrie, so we've got a bunch of questions about the um, ARP, the American Rescue Plan, and its effects on uh, the emergency paid sick leave and a emergency F, uh, family medical leave. Um, so, does the American Rescue Plan mandate that employers offer the EPSL and the EFML? So I love this question, Ted, because this paid time off during the pandemic has um, gone through three modifications. It's changed its name three times. So we have three different acronyms and it's been on the, the watch of two different presidents. So, I mean, it's no wonder that employers are completely confused by this. Um, the simple answer is no, it is not a mandate. Um, I'm not a history buff, didn't do well in history in school, but I do wanna give a little bit of history as to how it started where we are now. Um, so when it was signed into law under Trump, it was under FFCRA. Okay, and FFCRA expired December 31st of 2020. However, the tax credits were extended beyond December 31st, 2020 under the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And that started January 1st of 2021. So the paid time off was no longer mandatory. It became strictly voluntary. The employer would still receive the payroll tax credits. Well, that expired March 31st of this year. So then under the Biden administration, it then became American Rescue Plan. And again, that still is voluntary. It goes through April 1st through September 30th of this year. And then employers, obviously, if they voluntary, voluntarily offer this, um, they can get the uh, payroll tax credits. So under the FFCRA, there were certain reasons for which an employee would qualify for paid leave. Do these same reasons apply mm -hmm. under the American Rescue Plan? Yes, they do. So all the reasons that an employee would qualify for paid leave um, all remain the same, okay? And I'm just going to kind of briefly list uh, what those are. So it's an employee that's subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order that's related to COVID-19, an employee who's quarantining under the direction of a healthcare provider, um, an employee who's experiencing COVID symptoms and seeking a diagnosis, an employee that's caring for someone who is subject to a quarantine or seeking advice from a healthcare provider, 
And then the last one is caring for a child whose school or daycare is closed or unavailable due to COVID related reasons. So those are the reasons that have always existed from the onset of FFCRA. Now, under the American Rescue Plan, the statute now gives three additional reasons for which an employee would qualify. And those reasons are if the employee is obtaining, obtaining the COVID-19 vaccine, um, if the employee is recovering from a disability or illness related to getting the vaccine, or if that employee is waiting for a COVID-19 diagnosis or test. So under the emergency um, or expanded FML under FFCRA, the only reason that an employee could qualify for paid leave is if that employee needed to stay home with a child because the daycare or school was closed or unavailable due to COVID reasons. Now, under the American Rescue Plan, all of those old reasons and the new reasons that I just listed off, now all of those qualify under paid sick leave and are also the applicable reasons for which an employee would qualify under the expanded FML. So obviously a whole host of reasons but again, it is it is strictly voluntary. So if an employee had already used their 80 hours of paid sick leave prior to April 1st, do they qualify for another 80 hours? They do. So that whole bank of hours resets as of April 1st. So now that employee has 80 hours available and then the employer can also receive tax payroll tax credits for those 80 hours. So what about the expanded family medical leave? Does the employee get a new bucket of 12 weeks that can be used between April 1st and September 30th? So that's a good question. And Susan and I have um, attended many webinars and spoken to a couple of attorneys and really kind of the word on the street at this point is it's a gray area. There isn't anything in the law that defines if that in fact needs to happen where that employee gets that full 12 weeks available again. Um, what we're hearing is that because this is strictly voluntary, that employers have some flexibility. So, um, meaning that the employer, if they choose to um, offer this on a voluntary basis, they could, if they wanted, provide the full 12 weeks, or they could determine how many weeks under 12. So maybe they decide, you know what, we want to move forward with this and offer this on a voluntary basis, but instead of 12 weeks, we're more comfortable with three. So um, at this point, I think you're fine to do that. Um, and we're kind of kind we're we're keeping watch um, and reading a lot of updates with the DOL because I suspect there'll be some Q and A that comes out from the DOL that provides some more concrete answers to how to on how to administer this. So, Carrie, there's an awful lot of <clears throat> acronyms in here, and I uh, I actually went to the Urban Dictionary last night to look up what FML was, and <laughs> it doesn't really match what you're telling us today. So <laughs> keep keep that in mind. <laughs> so, so the next question I have here is last week, the Biden administration announced a new paid leave tax credit to offer PTO for employees who elect to get a COVID vaccination. Uh, what can you tell us about that? So um, this is geared towards those small businesses, small to mid-sized businesses, so less than 500 employees. And it's offering paid time off for those employees um, to actually get the vaccination. And then also um, time for any recovery should they feel ill as a result of getting those vaccination shots. Um, the tax credit for this paid sick leave can be claimed by um, eligible employers that are offering the 80 hours to each employee. Um, and it is at 100% of the employee's pay. Um, and then the tax credit for paid family uh, medical leave wages is equivalent to the family paid wages for up to 12 weeks 
at two thirds of the employer's regular rate of pay. So Biden signed this into law to really encourage employees to get the vaccine and provide them compensation um, in order to do so, and then in order to recover from, from the um, vaccination. Um, this is also voluntary. This is not mandatory. Well, and this, uh, one, one thing real quickly to add to this, um, Ted, it is for time off from April 1st through September 30th of this year. Perfect. I have a, another quick poll for everybody. You guys don't get to see the stuff I do. It's kind of fun to watch it on this end. <laughs> still got, still have responses coming in here. All right. I'm really curious on this one to see uh, what people are doing. Well, let's, let's find out. Okay. So pretty much down the middle with a mm -hmm. slight lead for those not voluntarily offering it. Yeah. All right. And in an effort of time, we are going to keep going because I just looked at my watch and it's already 924. So we've got a lot more to cover. So Carrie and I are going to talk very fast. <laughs> um, so Ted, what's our next question? So, so how is COVID impacting um, the 2021-2022 renewals? Okay, that's a great question. And time will tell is my answer. Um, I do think whether it's medical, dental or vision, that we are going to see um, uh, a lot of variance in our renewals. Uh, because of, as we all know, during 2020, a lot of people stopped all their uh, elective type surgeries. You know, they stop going to the dentist, they stop doing the eye care. So we're going to see an uptick in that. Uh, but, you know, so far, our renewals that we've had for 2021 have not been outrageous. So I, I want to tell all of you that don't don't worry um, too much about it. Keep your fingers crossed. But um, I do think there's going to be some effect, but we don't know truly what that will be yet. A lot of you are rated on your own experience if you're a large group. And so really it depends on your claims that you should be receiving. Um, and uh, some of you are part of what's called a community rated group on your renewals. So you're rated as a community. And so I do think there's gonna be an impact, but so far our renewals have not been too bad. Perfect. All right. So, so what are some of the, uh, so some of the more non-traditional benefits that, that um, employers are offering? That's a great question. And there is actually some really cool things that are happening. Um, and uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is HealthBridge. And I'm going to put a link to HealthBridge um, in the chat feature for all of you. So if you currently are a Blue Cross Blue Shield or with Blue Care Network, this is something that you definitely want to pay attention to. It is coming very soon. Um, and HealthBridge provides a service for your employees to pay their medical bills. So they provide financial and emotional safety net for your employees by allowing them a guaranteed and flexible payment option for their medical bills. So all of us who have been in HR and payroll, we get wage garnishments. This hopefully will help you curb that by allowing your employees to pay their medical bills through HealthBridge. I can't get into a great detail on this, but it is coming soon. They hopefully are going to be testing a couple priority health clients in the Kalamazoo area as well. Uh, Bronson should be signing on with HealthBridge soon. Um, and that's obviously huge for our area. And hopefully Ascension will follow after that. And then other um, hospitals in the um, Southwest area. There are hospitals in Grand Rapids that have already signed on to it. So I'm going to put the link also in the chat feature for you guys to look at. But, you know, as we know, 46% of Americans can't even handle a $400 emergency bill. So this is a, an answer to that. Other things that we're seeing are um, Eden Health is another one of our vendors for those of you who, who need help with tracking COVID. Um, they have done an awesome job for our clients. They do provide uh, telemedicine telemedicine 
telemedicine, my goodness. And they do uh, also provide some consultation on if an employee has issues with a bill and they don't understand it. So that's another one. Pet insurance is huge. We have that asked all the time is how can we provide pet insurance for my, you know, my favorite little furry uh, animals. And so pet insurance is something that you can offer. It doesn't cost you anything. You just basically provide them a link. Any type of financial wellness and uh, cons- uh, counseling education is huge as well. There's many um, people in the area who provide that. And I think that is a key. And if you can provide those classes and they're doing them all virtually. Chaplain services is another uh, area that we're finding employers are looking at adding chaplains. Um, and we have a great vendor for that. Is executive life and disability products, uh, executive medical plans, long-term care options. You can do this on a voluntary basis or an employer paid basis. Wish and reimbursement and loan payoff, travel insurance. We always suggest if your employees are traveling outside the United States, you can provide them an employer plan at a very low cost, or if they're traveling for pleasure, then they can buy a policy that's also very cost effective. Geo Blue has great options available. Um, home buying assistance. Uh, another thing we're going to talk hopefully later on if we have time is what an ICRA is. So Carrie, anything else that you have to add to that? I sort of feel guilty, Susan, because I get to talk about the fun and the flexible <laughs> benefits. <laughs> so um, concierge services is really popular now. So that's being able to bring in your dry cleaning, have the dry cleaner pick it up and then drop it off a couple of days later. Um, and this is something uh, also that we did here at Nolte. I think it was last year. Um, we had somebody come in and they set up in our parking lot and we got to have our cars detailed um, throughout the day. So it's all those those time consuming errands um, that we all have to do um, and manage home life and children and work. And so the concierge is, is a huge benefit. Um, we constantly get asked about gym memberships and what other companies are doing for that. And One of my clients, actually, this was super creative during the pandemic. Obviously, most of the gyms were closed or those that were open employees maybe were not comfortable going. Um, A lot of employees subscribed to online type of workout classes and spent money on getting their home gym set up. And so this particular client was reimbursing their employees for those online um, classes that they were taking. So that was a, a really neat idea. Um, some clients are doing summer hours. So between Memorial Day and Labor Day, um, they're closing at noon on Fridays. Um, a big one, as we all know, many of us have been working remotely for the past year um, and doing so successfully. So I think we're going to continue to see a a trend once we get through this pandemic of those employees who are going to push back a little bit and say, hey, you know, I've been I've been working just fine from home. Are you really going to require me to come in full time where maybe it'll be, um, you know, a a negotiation where it's part time at home, part time in the office Um, new parent leave programs. So. If you're a smaller employer and you don't um, qualify for FMLA, um, sometimes clients are offering leave programs. Um, So paid leave for for employees who um, adopt a baby um, or have a baby. And then in addition to that, for those of you who do offer FMLA, we all know after the FMLA leave of 12 weeks, some clients are then saying, okay, we're going to give you an additional bucket of time so you can stay home and, and bond with your child a little bit longer. Uh, food discounts, so gift cards to um, area restaurants, hopefully hopefully local restaurants so we can continue to support our local uh, small businesses. Um, college tuition assistance, uh, gender confirming surgery, Adoption benefits is a big one, um, and then funeral um, expense benefits. So, Ted, did I miss anything? 
Well, you, you did. Um, we, we've got so we've got a, we've got at least one client that has a beverage cart that, that roams around the office in, on a particular afternoon. Some people get Diet Coke. Some people get a little harder beverage. Um, mm-hmm. My personal favorite was when Nulty instituted Fireball Fridays. That was awesome. <laughs> And we copied really? that from one of our I'm clients. Sure I heard so. of that. I <laughs> did that here. So we don't all have Fireball Fridays at Nulty. But <laughs> well, we better I be think- careful. Our HR manager is on the uh, <laughs> webinar, so we, we better be careful. Okay, let's we'll just keep that between the two of us, and everybody else <laughs> can it. forget what I said. La 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 la. <laughs> all um, right. Well, let's keep going. We've All right. So, left. so what about COVID-19 vaccines in the workplace, Gary? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, generally speaking, um, it is recommended for employers to offer vaccinations um, to their employees on a voluntary basis. But in answer to your question, Ted, yes, employers can require it. Um, it's kind of no different than you know, the healthcare industry and some of, some of the high-risk industries that have required flu, flu vaccines for years. So um, yes, you can, you can make it mandatory. However, you got to remember the EEOC guidance on it. So employers who require their employees to get the COVID-19 vaccine um, must be able to respond appropriately to an employee who comes to them and says, hey, um, I, I can't get the vaccine because um, I have a disability or um, I have a, a religious belief that um, doesn't allow me to do that. So we need to be careful about those and, and respond appropriately um, to those employees. So can an employer require that employees demonstrate proof of the vaccine? Yes, um, they absolutely can. One of the things that's important, though, is it really should be a simple yes, no answer. Um, you know, because of HIPAA, we want to make sure that when we ask the question, we're not asking follow-up questions, which might solicit the employee to give us more information about their medical condition. So a yes, no is all we need. So what if a vaccinated employee is exposed to an employee who exhibits COVID-19 um, symptoms and tests positive for COVID-19? Um, Does the vaccinated employee actually have to quarantine still? So um, a couple of weeks ago, and I double checked this yesterday because we know how frequently these laws change. um, The CDC guidance does suggest that a fully vaccinated person um, does not have to quarantine if they've been fully vaccinated and not not exhibiting any symptoms. So fully vaccinated means that if they've had the Moderna and Pfizer second shot, two weeks have lapsed since that second shot. So that's being fully vaccinated. And then with the J&J shot, it's two weeks after that first shot, um, that individual then is fully vaccinated. So I just want to plug in, for those of you who are SHRM members, um, there are some fantastic uh, COVID-19 vaccination resources on, they have a landing page uh, set up um, on the SHRM website, which is SHRM.org. And even sometimes if you're not a member there, you still have access to some information out there. You don't get the full the full gamut of, of information if you're not a member, but it's worth checking out. Um, and then the Job Accommodation Network. It's also called JAN. If you have questions about accommodations and things like that, um, askjan.org is a good place to go for that. It really is. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. One, one, one quick, uh, one, one more polling question for us. And that is, are you guys making vaccines mandatory at your workplace? This is a good one. Yeah, this is going to be interesting to see the results. All right, let's uh, let's take a look at those. Wow, that is, that is not what I expected to see at all. Same. I thought to see a little bit more people. Yeah, yeah. interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay, 
Well, let's keep going. And uh, I did see that there's a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A. We will get to those um, after this webinar. So I don't want you to feel that we won't answer those for you. So what's next, Ted? So uh, a, a common question that, that we were receiving is, how, how do we know if we're offering benefits that are competitive in the current marketplace? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. And truly, I think one of the ways to do that is to benchmark yourselves. Benchmark yourselves against your peers locally, uh, against your peers state and national. And uh, we're excited to announce that we do actually have a new health plan uh, survey that we are taking part of with a new partnership of ours called UBA. And uh, for all of you that are clients, we actually are going to be putting that data in for you on your behalf. We might have to ask you a few questions, but we we have most of your data. Uh, if you are a uh, not a client of Nolfi, which of course it's someday we hope you are, but and you would like to participate in this health plan survey, um, we can get you the questions. It is really great information. Um, and we can run data analytics all year long. And so it's it's going to give us a vast majority. We just ran it uh, uh, yesterday for one of our clients and they're in the educational realm. And there was over 5,000 touch points, uh, data points that uh, people who were involved in the survey. So we can get you some really good information. So so I think that's the best thing to do is to benchmark against your, uh, your peers locally. So. So, so the next question, guys, and you can fight over who answers it, but what, what is the Consolidated Appropriations Act? Uh, okay. How much time do we have, I know. This, we, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to summarize this. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. So President Trump signed this, at the, I think, on December 27th of 2020. Uh, we have broke it down into five different parts, and we're going to touch on these really briefly just because of time. Um, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot a lot of this we don't know timelines yet, but um, especially if you're self-insured, there are some things that you actually need to do. If you're fully insured, the carrier is going to handle this mostly for you. So I'm going to start going really brief. So the first part of this is, and you probably have heard some of this, but preventing surprise medical bills. The Trump administration said enough of this. We don't want to have surprise medical bills. So working with insurance carriers to make sure that does not happen. Ending surprise air ambulance bills. That is something, again, that they want to, if you guys have been involved in any of those, they can be super expensive and there's not a lot of coverage. So audit process and regulations for qualifying payment amounts. Determination of out of network rates to be paid by health plans and independent dispute resolution process. So they want to work, they want to have people uh, it to be more transparent and a place to find out how they can go about determining what these rates should be. So more transparency regarding in network, out of network deductibles, and out of pocket limitations. They don't they want uh, the Americans to know what is considered out of network. Uh, they want, they want, excuse me, they want to have a maintenance of price comparison tools. So there should be, a lot of our carriers have price comparison tools out there, not all of them, but they want to have uh, this readily available. Provider directory information and disclosure of billing protection. So that is part one. Carrie, you want to get into part two really quick? No, absolutely. Um, common theme in the Consolidated Act is transparency and dis disclosure. So yep. um, another component is disclosure of broker compensation. So um, very simply, what this does is keep us honest, keep brokers honest, and provide transparency. So these disclosure obligations um, include descriptions of the services that are provided, all direct and indirect compensation, um, Description of compensation set on a transaction basis, so commissions and finder fees. Um, the, the disclosure of compensation does actually apply beginning December 27th of 2021. Not sure why they chose the 27th, but that's odd. Um, I'm going to roll right into uh, the Voluntary Temporary Health FSA and DCAP which is dependent care flexible spending arrangements. So there's been some relief um, under those programs. 
One is the carryover of unused amounts to the next plan year. So from 2020 to 2021 and 21 to 2022, um, employers have the discretion to designate whether they want the entire unused amount to roll over or they can designate to have less than that amount. And the employer can set a discretion date um, by which those carryover amounts uh, must be used. Um, they extended the grace period to 12 months after the end of the plan year. Again, the employer can set a uh, discretion to extend the grace period for uh, less than 12 months if they wish. Um, the DCAP carryover forward went from age 13 to 14. Um, and the Appropriations Act also added 2021 temporary uh, FSA increase limits from uh, it went from 2,500 to 5,250 for single, and then married couple, married couples uh, can contribute up to 10,500, which is a huge jump from what it was at 5,000. Uh, Mid-year election plan changes. Um, the plan affords participants to respectively change existing FSA and DCAP elections for 2021 at any time during the plan year in 2021 without a change in status. All right. Um, one reminder is to amend your plan documents. And many of you probably are working with another party that um, administers all of these FSA DCAP programs for you. I would work with them. They should be able to um, take the lead on amending uh, these plans for you. And then lastly, uh, menstrual care and over-the-counter drug coverage um, is now eligible under FSA and HRAs. And this is part of the CARES Act. Back to you, Susan. Okay, I'm going to do this real quick because we are running out of time and we've got two other questions we want to get to. So the other part of it is the mental health and substance uh, substance use parity. The main thing is with this is they want to make sure that these benefits are treated in the same ma manner as major medical. So there's a comparative analysis that may need to be done. So the DOL can request this. Um, if you're fully insured, then the carrier is going to do this for you. If you're self-insured, then um, you will have to work with your TPA to help you with that. I'm going to run through. Some, there's some other things here um, that I'm not going to get to. We can uh, put this in an email to you. But reporting on pharmacy benefits, drug costs, and other health care services, that is a big one that's coming down the pipe as well. Um, it's beginning at the end of this year, again, December 27th. So uh, that one you have to, we will all need to watch out for. So we're running down of time. So Carrie, you want a quick answer uh, to question number eight? Sure. Um, what's new with the HSAs? Uh, very quickly, personal protective equipment. Um, so PPE during the pandemic, meaning your face masks, your hand sanitizers, hand hand wipes, sanitizing wipes, all of those you can now use HSA dollars for. Perfect. Tad, I think we, do we have one more question? We have one more question and, and there seem to be a lot of changes in the HRA um, tax code um, regarding QSERAs and ICRAs and stuff like that. Do you, can you give us a little highlight on how that works? I will, because we're running out of time. And I can send everybody a chart on this, but there's a lot of talk on this. And this is something that employers should look into. If you are a small employer under 50, there's what's called a qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement. That might be good for an employer who is not has not provided any type of coverage, but now they want to add medical benefits. So I'm not going to get into that one too much. But ICRAs, Individual Coverage Health Reimbursement Arrangement. This is an option for all employer size groups. So it doesn't matter if you're five or if you have 200. This is an option that you should look at. Now, there are certain regulations, but um, for CFOs who want to have just their everything planned out and know exactly what they, they're going to spend their healthcare dollars on, this might be an option. And there's a lot of great vendors out there. Uh, the other, the third one is called the Accepted Benefit Health Reimbursement Arrangement. All three of these, we have a great chart that we can share with you on what they mean. Uh, but I think they are definitely some options for employers, especially if you have high turnover, um, you struggle with costs. So we're going to be looking at them for a few of our clients. But uh, just know there are regulations that we all need to follow. So 
Great. Well, thank you too so much for participating today and doing a great job answering all the questions that our that our attendees submitted. If anybody has any questions after this, feel free to reach out to your uh, favorite Nulti teammate, and we'll be happy to help any way we can. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Enjoy the sunny weekend.